Welcome to Better Sex, where you get the information and inspiration to create and enjoy your best possible sex life. Join your host, sex therapist Jessa Zimmerman, as she brings you expert guests, helpful tips, knowledge, and strategies to improve your intimate relationships. And now, your host, Jessa Zimmerman. Hi, everybody. I'm Jessa, and I'm so happy you're here for this episode of Better Sex. I've dedicated my professional life to helping couples enjoy a fulfilling, intimate life. I believe that sex is important. Our connections to other people matter, and we're not living our life to the fullest if we aren't connecting emotionally and sexually with our partner. That's why I'm here, bringing ideas and information to help you live and love better. Thanks for joining me today. I'm excited about the topic. I I realize I say that every week because I'm excited about all these topics. But today we're talking about a different way to approach some of the sexual baggage or negativity that we bring into our adult lives. So there's a concept of fragmentation or parts of us, you know, part of us feels this way and a part of us feels that way. And my guest today is talking about how those parts develop. How does that fragmentation occur? And especially how do we take in these negative beliefs, you know, sex negativity in a way that we don't maybe even understand or recognize, uh, but shows up in our sex life as adults? right? Whether it's a lack of interest in sex or a hard time to relax and get into our body or hard to connect with a partner or, you know, where trauma is on our way, all kinds of different ways that the problems show up in our sex life can be rooted in this idea of fragmentation. So she works in a very embodied way with clients, getting them into their physical experience and thinking about that and learning to trust their body and follow what their body has to say to sort of heal and, I guess, repair those messages that we've picked up along the way. So my guest is Melissa Walker, who is a therapist. She works with couples and individuals. She's the director of the Embodied Relationships Counseling Center in Colorado, and she's a certified sex therapist, and she's developed this approach and this way of thinking about working with people to heal the fragmentation that they have in their sex lives. I hope you enjoyed the episode. So, Melissa, thank you so much for being here today. Thanks for having me. Yeah, I'm excited to learn more about your, you know, I don't know if it's your concept of fragmentation, but could you start out with talking about what that is and how you see this? Yeah, Um, I think the the word fragmentation comes from more general psychotherapy kind of parts work. Okay. Um, What I mean by that in terms of sex therapy is that because we are such highly socialized creatures, that there are basically competing needs that we have within us. We have the needs of our desire and arousal, and then we have the social needs that that are often competing in society. So that's what I mean by fragmentation. Okay. So I guess at that point, you're saying we're not working as an integrated whole. These needs are sort of at odds with each other or competition or something like that. Yeah, exactly. Okay. Okay. So how, how do we get fragmented? So as we are developing as young ones in our uh, sexual development and social development, we begin to explore the world in lots of different ways. And one of the ways that we start to explore the world as young people is through pleasure and what we find pleasurable and discovering what, what is happening in our bodies. And oftentimes we're told that exploring our bodies in more sexual ways is wrong. So like if mom walks in while the the young one is exploring their arousal anatomy um, and mom says, oh, don't do that, that's bad or whatever, then, then uh, a wedge gets created between us and our own bodies. You know, how is it that something that feels good and can be a, a curious exploration, how can that be bad? And so that, that fundamental wedge gets created within us. Okay. But I'm assuming there's, 
I mean, I'm thinking, you know, of my clients who've had impacts more than just maybe mom shaming them about masturbation or something, you know, there's sort of the cultural messages or there's pornography or all, all the different things that might create some of those wedges, right? I mean, yeah. is this the kind of thing that you yeah. get fragmented repeatedly over the course of your life, perhaps? Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. yeah I mean, we are, if, if we look at, you know, how we are in society, we're embedded within layers and layers and layers of social structures and social institutions and our primary relationships are with our caregivers, um, which is the example that I gave there. Right. Um, and then, and then the next ring out of that, the next layer is school and religion and media and all of these layers that impact us and get actually embedded within us. And that all becomes part of this, this fragmentation that happens. Okay. And so the more tension there is or the more negative yeah. influences or the more inconsistency between these messages, I'm imagining that leads to more fragmentation. Absolutely. Right. Than yeah. one event or one, one aspect that's giving you a negative message or something like that. Yeah, absolutely. And so we become really incongruent in, in how we experience our bodies and our sexuality as well as how we express it. Right. Yeah. Okay. And, and would you say that I mean, we don't want to generalize, I suppose, but basically everyone yeah. is fragmented. I mean, is this, you know, is this a universal experience to some degree or another? Absolutely. Okay. Yeah, yeah absolutely. And and I want to say that I, I don't necessarily think this is a negative thing. I think that the, the structures of socialization around us give us challenges to look at ourselves. They're, they're mirrors for us. Sometimes they're accurate. Sometimes they're not. And those challenges really encourages us to, to explore and to expand and to learn new things about ourselves. It's just that when it comes to sexuality, there's so much shadow and, and just sex negativity in general in our right. culture that we're more heavily impacted by that, I think. Yeah, yeah. And probably mostly impacted in a negative direction as opposed to positive. I mean, I'm sure there's exceptions to that, but <laughs> on, ba on balance, right? Our culture and our family and our religion and all, all these various spheres are, you know, are more likely to give us negative messages. Yeah. I mean, as we're growing up, you know, we're in elementary school, junior high, high school. Um, we're given lots of spaces to do critical thinking about critical thinking and exploration around math and science and maybe the arts or music or all kinds of things. And there are very few places where we're given the space to explore and do critical thinking around sexuality and our developing bodies and relationship and intimacy and consent and all of these things. Yeah. Yeah. So there's a lot of us that's in shadow. There's things that we don't even realize are impacting us and yet are impacting us pretty heavily because we just haven't explored things. We don't know what, what the options are out there. Yeah, we don't know what we don't know, right? I mean, it's, yeah. <laughs> or as I'll say to clients, or what, you know, it's sort of the water we swim in, we don't recognize it, right? It's just, yes. this is our environment. So, yes, yeah. absolutely. Yeah. So, so how do we recognize the fragmentation? Like, how does this show up in a, you know, in a problematic way or, or a learning opportunity way? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, I'm also a sex therapist. Mm -hmm. And so, when I see clients, what one of the most common topics that, the, the clients will bring in to discuss with me is my my partner desires something different than I do or at a different level than I do. And I see people shaming themselves. I should want this more. I should be more open to things or um, perhaps shaming their partners. Yeah. Um, I, you know, what they're into is weird or, you know, I hear lots of like shaming, judgmental kind of language. Right. Because really a fundamental fear that we've developed around arousal, our own experience of sexual arousal and, and the sexual arousal of our, of our partners. Okay. So that sense of maybe being threatened by something or defensive yeah. about something or yeah. fearful, anxious, like all those negative emotions sort of zero in on the fact that, that we have this sort of fragmented approach. Yes. Or experience. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Because when we're when we're afraid of something, right, it means that there's so much unknown in that area and, and potentially a, a deep wound that has happened there that we can't even touch it. It's, wow. it's so much easier to label it as bad or wrong or weird or different or whatever than to, than to drop into a place in, our, in ourselves where we can say, 
okay, let's explore this. Let's talk about this. You know, it takes a while for me to help clients to get to that point, feeling safe enough to explore arousal and desire and, and sexuality and all these things. Right, right. To sort of cultivate like curiosity about it, right? Instead of, yes. instead of pulling yes. back, how do you lean in and have curiosity? Yes. Something that's more accepting. Yeah. But I suppose, I mean, by the time people are coming into our office, they're at least open to change, I guess. I mean, largely, yes. right? Like that is one step towards thinking yeah. something, we're not quite dealing with this right. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And that's the beauty of it is that the, the people that come into our offices, they say, something's not right and we want it to be better. I mm -hmm. want a better connection. I want to explore my sexuality. I want to have that relationship that I have not been able to have until yeah. this or had and then lost for whatever reason. Right, right. And then is this language that you use with your clients? I mean, you talk about fragmentation and, uh, you know, is this framework a helpful thing for them to to understand? Or is this something you've got in your mind guiding your work, but they're not necessarily uh, yeah. thinking this way? Right. I mean, sometimes I use the word fragmentation. It depends on the client, I would mm -hmm. say. But I really like to speak more towards what we're working on or what we're developing. And I'll say, instead of fragmentation, I'll say, there's one part of you that wants this. There's another part of you that wants something different. And that's actually really normal and healthy. And here's how we're going to explore it by developing, you know, embodied expressiveness, embodied sexuality. Yeah. Okay. Well, that leads into, you know, my next question, which is, what's your approach to working with or healing fragmentation? Like, I, I don't even know if you use the word healing since you're saying it's not necessarily a negative thing, but, yeah. but you know, what's the general theory that you're using, I guess, what you're, where you're wanting people to get to, and then how do you actually do it with clients? Yeah, yeah and even in the, the fragmentation that happens that's normal, it still needs healing. Okay. <laughs> like primary wound stuff there. Often okay. Time. Yeah, so that definitely. So I'm a body centered therapist, which means that, you know, I do I do engage the mind of my clients and we do critical thinking and we do brainstorming and we tell, you know, the stories of, of their bodies and their experiences. And then we really drop it down into the place, the original place. It's like ground zero, like this is where these things happened, you know this is how I experienced touch, or this is how, this is what happened in my body when I learned about how scary STIs can be, for example, you know, so I really drop into the place where these things originally impacted people and help them reacquaint themselves with the language of the body through sensation and movement and things like that. And um, so that when we're talking about how do they heal and expand their sexuality with themselves and with relationship, that they're really doing it from the ground up. They're really mm -hmm. doing it in the present moment. So do people generally, you know, do they need to remember the instances where these little wounds happen? Like they've got to remember learning about STIs in health class or their mom making them feel bad about exploring their pleasure? Yeah, that's a great question. Not necessarily, not necessarily. So for example, if I'm working with a couple, and they're talking about a recent sexual experience where something happened that they were really uncomfortable with. What, what we'll do is actually drop the narrative of it because we can really get stuck in our minds and with the story and, and identify more with the story. Yeah. And this is the place where we want to de-identify with the story. We want to take a step back and say, okay, this is what your mind is telling you is happening. What's actually happening in your body in this moment? And when okay. we get to that level, people will say, oh, I feel... I feel tension in my chest. I feel sick to my stomach. And I'll say, does this feel familiar to you from anywhere else? And some people have memories of sex ed class that was really uncomfortable yeah. or uh, experiencing some kind of trauma when they were younger or, you know, they might have a memory and they might not. And okay. that's the beautiful thing about this work is that they don't have to remember the memory to have the, the healing and the expansiveness in their sexuality actually happen. Okay. So do you mind sort of following that along? Like this example, you've got a couple, they've had something that felt uncomfortable. One person's remembering, you know, goes into their body and says, yes, I've had this experience before. Sex ed class was like, you know, mm -hmm. I had the same sort of tension in my stomach. And then how do you move somebody, you know, what do you do then? Mm -hmm. So for example, with the, with the person who 
Um, cause I, I mean, I see this a lot, right. People have really bad experiences and yeah. wherever they learned it, you know? Right. And, um, so in that moment they'll say, oh, you know, I have this memory of being in sex ed class and learning about STIs and, and, oh, I feel like really yucky in my body now and this sort of thing. And in that moment, I'll have them soften the memory once again mm -hmm. and actually help to regulate their nervous system in the moment. So we'll do a mini like uh, guided meditation, really getting it, them into their bodies and noticing what the sensations are and that sort of thing. And just the noticing of sensation helps people shift into a more receptive state. They begin mm. to feel safer. It's like, oh, my body makes sense to me, you know? Okay. Um, and so from there, they start to realize, oh my gosh, I had such negative messages growing up and I don't want that anymore. And so when we're in that receptive state, that's when the, the shift starts to happen in people. Okay. Hi, it's Jessa here, taking just a quick break. Thanks for listening so far. I wanted to let you know about the sex quiz that I've put together called How Healthy Is Your Sex Life? I've taken a close look at the typical ways that I see couples get into trouble with sex, including avoidance, neglect, negativity, distraction, and boredom. And the free quiz will score your individual results based on these factors. And then I provide my recommendations and ideas, including my top 10 sex tips, which will help you make instant improvement. If you'd like to take the quiz and see how healthy your sex life is, you can do it right now at sexhealthquiz.com. And you wrote something about, I think you said erotic mindfulness. Mm -hmm. Uh, listening to your arousal versus following it blindly. And I was really curious about what you meant by that. I mean, that sounds a little bit of a leap from what you're talking about right now with clients, but it's yeah. part of the process here. It is, absolutely. So erotic mindfulness is one of the first things that I support my clients to develop a practice in. It's a, it's a practice. It's a mindfulness practice, right? Okay. So, but it's a, it's a body-centered mindfulness practice where we we engage the mind in service of slowing down and quieting the mind chatter, the, the chatter and all the stories that can happen so that they can say, oh, I notice I'm having that my mind is saying this right now and I'm going to let that go and I'm going to come back into my body. Okay, what feels good in my body? And then following that, right? So it's, the, it's a process of slowing down, noticing any discomfort that rises, any distracting thoughts and saying, oh, there's a thought about this and out breath, I'm going to come back into my body. Where does it feel good? And then following that pathway in the body. Okay. So you're actually encouraging the clients to, it, it sounds like effectively get aroused. Like we're, we're using pleasurable erotic touch and we're following where that leads in a positive way, which means letting go of the chatter in your mind and yeah. I suppose getting more and more aroused in this process, yes. probably, right? Yes, it, it absolutely can happen. Yeah, we're, yeah. we're re redirecting from what doesn't feel good and the, you know, defensiveness, not, not making the defensiveness go away because it's there for a reason. It's there to protect us. It's there to let us know, hey, I might want something different or I'm not comfortable right now. So, so erotic mindfulness allows for the noticing of the defensiveness and the uncomfortableness and say, oh, here's information. Okay. And I'm going to come back into what feels good. And arousal can happen from that. Absolutely. Right. right. And then do you have the client, you know, if it's a couple that's working on this, are they talking through this? I mean, you know, is there communication? I'm just wondering how much that might pull them up into their head a little bit to be analyzing and talking versus just experiencing. I, like that must seem, seems to me like a little bit of a dance between those things. It is a dance between them. Absolutely. Because I'll have clients say, I'll have them like one partner exploring the other person's hand, for example. Mm -hmm. um, and so they'll be noticing how it feels to make contact, noticing how it feels to receive contact. And right there, the meditation and the, the mindfulness can happen where yeah. they, you know, whatever thoughts come in, they say, oh, there's a thought. And I come back to the feeling of my partner's hand on my hand. Yeah. So it's a it's a combination of those things. And I I I really work to keep them into those 
the, the sort of brain state where they're really focused inward and I encourage them to stay there. Mm -hmm. And then, yeah, then they share with each other, what was that like? And, and what did you enjoy and what came up for you afterward? Oh, did okay. You, okay. Uh, so it's sort of, yeah, a more physical experience and then the analysis or the talking after. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. So. Okay. And that's the space where I really invite the critical thinking like, wow, you had a different experience there. Let's talk about that. You know, yeah. what does that mean for you? And things like that. Right. And I don't know if um, if you have anything more to say about the benefits of the body aspect of this work. I mean, the importance of that is you're working with clients that are dealing with sexual yeah. sexual issues and fragmentation. Yeah, yeah. I mean, the 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 body, the the nonverbal space of the body is the very first place that we learn things. Yeah. So as as little ones, before we have language, before we understand language. We understand touch and voice tone and breath and heartbeat and all of these things. Yeah. And so learning, we learn so much in the first couple of years of life. And a lot of these messages about, is my body safe? That sort of thing it is learned at that point. And even when we develop the facility of language, we still are learning so much with our bodies. When I'm working with the the whole person in my office, it's harnessing that that innate ability of us to learn through our bodies and fundamentally shift how we think about things through that. Yeah. So I, now I'm wondering if you get clients. I'm imagining you get clients who've had some sort of trauma, who don't know how to get into their body or really resist it. Like I would imagine you're getting people that are, you know, terrified of this or or just not you know not going to get there. I mean, yeah. or don't want to or something like that. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Because we received so many messages growing up that there's something about our bodies that's not okay. Yeah. We put a lot of emphasis on the power of the mind. Mm -hmm. um, and so, and I do have people, you know, when I ask them what they notice in their bodies when they're telling an emotional story or a difficult story or that sort of thing. Yeah. Um, sometimes they won't have access to sensation in in certain parts of their body, in most of their body. Right, like, right. So, yeah, so often that's a big part of the work that I do is just getting people connected with their sensations again. We literally prune connections between our mind and our body when it's unsafe or it's uncomfortable, you know, that sort of thing. So that often is a big chunk of the work. And, it, you know, sex and sexual intimacy happens in the body. And so if we can't, we can't sense what's happening in our bodies. We can't feel ourselves. Right. We're going to come in and say, Oh my gosh, I don't enjoy sex with my partner. And I want to do that. Right. So I'm going to help them get back into an awareness of sensations in their bodies so that they can know themselves better, but then also enjoy, enjoy sex with themselves or with the partner or partners. Yeah. So what, you know, I'm imagining the people listening, some of them will connect with this idea, right? They've had trauma or they're, they're that separated from their physical experience. Yeah. What, what could somebody do to start that process on their own, right? They're not in Colorado, say, <laughs> to come see you. So what's, what sort of a progression that allows them to, to gradually become aware of sensation and be in their body and make that a safe experience again? Mm -hmm. That's a great question. So oftentimes, especially with people who have experienced sexual trauma, where being in their being in relationship with their sexuality is just really they're just not ready to go there and yeah. i'm not going to push them you know right right because i want to make it as safe as possible so what i'll do is i'll help them think about where are the areas in their life where they do experience pleasure not necessarily sexual pleasure but like what's their favorite meal that they eat mm. where is their favorite place to go hiking what the kind of movement exercise do they do that they really love? Are they a painter? Are they uh, whatever? You know, it's mm -hmm. like anything that we love to do. That is where our experience of pleasure has been redirected. Okay. And so when we really get people in touch with just exploring a thousand percent what they already love to do, they're getting in touch with their sexuality through, through perhaps a different pathway than we would initially expect. Okay, so you get them grounded, and and I imagine focusing on their physical experience while they're painting or whatever it is. Yeah, right? paying attention to their body in that way, and that starts to open up access across other dimensions. Yep, 
Absolutely. Absolutely. Okay. Yeah. And then what about people that, you know, say they, they have no desire, they're asexual or their libido is just completely gone. Mm-hmm. You know, they used to have it. It's not like, mm-hmm. it's not like they were um, fragmented with negative messages so much that they really never enjoyed sex. Right. Like yeah. where does this come into play with somebody yeah. who's maybe lost desire? Absolutely. Sexuality is, is a, a much broader concept in the way that I, I use it that, Sometimes it involves, you know, the libido and sex and arousal anatomy and things like that. But not always. I mean, people who identify as asexual, they may not be interested in sex, although they may still have sex with, you know, a partner or partners. But they do experience pleasure somewhere in their life. Yeah. And also is is a part of their sexuality. It's seeing seeing sexuality as a generative force within us. And sex and sexual behavior is just one component of just the vast uh, realm of possibility that sexuality really is. Right. And and I guess not the be all and end all if somebody's not interested in that. Absolutely. Right. Yeah. I mean, it, to me, it's a different thing if somebody's yeah. suffering the loss of sex, right? Yes. Trying to help them regain that. But somebody who may be asexual really doesn't. Yes. It, no, nothing lost to them, but yes. to still enrich their sensual and sexual experience in life, even if it doesn't involve sexual contact with somebody else. Right. Yeah. 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 We're, we're, we're all sensual creatures. Yeah. You know? And someone may not enjoy uh, sex, but they enjoy a really good massage. Right. That's pleasurable to them, you know, not in the sexually arousing kind of way, but it feels pleasurable. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So yeah. I guess take takeaway message would be pay attention to our physical experience and follow the pleasure where it goes. I mean, you know, just pay attention to what's pleasing, right? Yes, absolutely. And, and to, and to consider trusting our bodies, trusting Hmm. our bodies and slowing down and getting underneath all of those negative messages that we received into the place of, you know, hang on, my body's telling me something here and really listening closely. Okay, cool. So yeah. where, where can people find more about you? Like, what would you like to say? You know, certainly I'll put any links you want in the show notes, things like that. But you yeah. know, what do you want to say about people uh, finding you or using any resources you have available? Yeah. So I'm the director of Embodied Relationships Counseling Center. And we have a website. It's embodiedrelationshipscenter.com. Mm-hmm. And on there you have, uh, there's information about me and the therapist who works with me and all the workshops and talks and things like that that we have coming up. Okay, great. And is some of this available to people that are not local to you? Yes. Um, okay, great. That's good to know. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, and I talk at, you know, conferences around the country and things like that. So, you know, I'm around. Okay. And I assume maybe you've got a mailing list or something so people can keep up to date with what you're doing too. Yeah. So if you go to the website, there's a place to sign up for my newsletter. And I do um, send out a monthly blog and it uh, has updates about events and things like that. Yeah. Perfect. Perfect. Yeah. Well, great. Thank you so much for being here and sharing about this. It's really cool. Thanks so much for having me. Yeah. You've been listening to Better Sex. Please visit our website, bettersexpodcast.com, for show notes and additional episodes. And that's a wrap for today. I really hope you enjoyed the episode. If you are enjoying the podcast, if some of this material resonates with you and you would like to make a difference and make sure that this keeps coming out in the world once a week, ongoing, There are a couple things you could do to show your appreciation. The first would be to go to iTunes and rate and review the show. That really helps us be found by new listeners when you review the show on iTunes. You can find a link at bettersexpodcast.com slash iTunes. The other thing I want to invite you to consider is becoming a Patreon. For a small monthly pledge, you get some benefits. So for $2 a month, you get advanced access to every single episode. For $5 a month, you get a chapter of my upcoming new book. And for $10 a month, I host quarterly get to know you and question and answer chats over the web. And you get invited to that. 
I would love to have your membership in that. Become part of the Better Sex family. You can find a link at bettersexpodcast.com slash Patreon, which is P-A-T-R-E-O-N. Again, thanks for listening. I'm glad you're here. Feel free to comment, ask questions, get in touch. I'd love to hear from listeners. Thanks. Thanks.